Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Bill Bolding, and welcome to the Distinguished Speaker Series uh, from Duke's Fuqua School of Business. Tonight, we are thrilled to have join us uh, Jacqueline Novogratz, who is the uh, founder and CEO of Acumen. I'll say a little bit more about her, but first, a, a quick digression which is in many ways, I view this as the, uh, the opening salvo in uh, our conference that starts tomorrow, the Sustainable Business and uh, Social Impact Conference. And so I just want to put in a quick pitch for that, tom uh, that event tomorrow, uh, where we're going to have keynotes from leaders uh, from Ben & Jerry's, Starbucks, Apple, uh, and Echoing Green. And so uh, please join us tomorrow for that great event. But for now, I am so thrilled uh, that we have such a special guest with us. And uh, this, is, uh, this is someone who left Wall Street uh, very early in her career and founded a microfinance startup in Rwanda. In 2001, she founded uh, Acumen, and through that vehicle, she has, this is probably dated information, uh, but, uh, but she has built, helped build 136 social enterprises. She's brought basic uh, services such as uh, affordable education, uh, healthcare, clean water, energy and sanitation to more than 308 million people, which is an incredible uh, accomplishment and a way to truly leverage the impact uh, of business. In 2015, uh, Fast Company named Acumen as one of the world's top 10 most innovative nonprofit organizations. And in 2017, Forbes uh, named Jacqueline as one of the world's 100 greatest living business minds. And so, uh, clearly, we are in the presence of, of true greatness. Um, it's also uh, the case that, that Fuqua is connected uh, to Acumen. Uh, you, you have hired from Fuqua uh, your, your former uh, chief innovation officer, actually sits on our advisory board for our impact investing initiative. And of course, 12 short years ago, uh, we brought you onto campus to give you our Leadership in Social Entrepreneurship Award, and you spoke to us back then. So welcome back. We are thrilled to have you. Thank you so much, Dean Bonini. It's wonderful to be here. So uh, it, just as a, a starting point here, uh, without a doubt, for many people who are joining us this evening and for many people around the world, you are a hero uh, and, and a source of tremendous inspiration. And so I'm just curious as you've, as you've gone through your journey, uh, who, who were your heroes and, and who inspired you to go onto this path that you chose? Hmm. Thanks. And it's funny, you know, I've been thinking so much about heroes and how we don't need more heroes. We need a, a, a million heroic acts. And yet, Role models, which I know you talk about, are so important. And, and I would say as a little girl, my role models um, and heroes were um, the very few women that showed up in biography books uh, at the school library. So Harriet Tubman, Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor, um, Jane, um, Jane Adams, and, um, and, Eleanor, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And then as I got older, um, I guess one of the biggest gifts of going to business school was meeting a man named John Gardner, who was the um, Secretary of Health Education and Welfare for President Johnson during the Civil Rights Movement. And, um, and John was this very patrician uh, a man, the only Republican on um, Johnson's cabinet. And, um, and a man that understood the power of the public sector as well as the private sector, was continually renewing himself, lived with real principle 
And so uh, at one point he resigned his position from the cabinet and pro in protest to the Vietnam War and started Common Cause, which was a citizens group, grassroots citizens group at age 54. And, um, and when he was mentoring me at age 82, uh, he started another nonprofit because he thought the elderly should also be um, contributing more to civil society and it would keep them forever young. So I think I was very lucky to have met him early in my life. So uh, if we go back in time to uh, when you were a newly minted Stanford MBA, uh, you, you chose Wall Street. Why did you make that choice? Well, actually, um, I, I, cho I chose Wall Street right after undergrad. Ah, undergrad. Uh, and it was sort of accidental. Um, I didn't want to be a banker, decidedly, but um, I had paid my way through a university and my parents made a deal with me when I explained to them that I had no intention actually to take any job because I had worked you know, 40, 50 hours a week all through college. And so I, um, my mom and dad being very smart and also the immigrant family were having heart attacks that I wasn't taking a conventional job. So they said, that's fine as long as you go through the interview process because it'll, at least it'll be a good experience for you. And so I put my resumes in the boxes to show you it was the stone age. Um, that took foreign affairs and economics, which was my double degree, and I got a, a, a job interview with Chase Manhattan Bank. Walk into the interview, sit down. The guy says, so tell me, Mr. Novogratz, why do you want to be a banker? Which was the one question I wasn't prepared for. And so I said, uh, uh, well, I don't want to be a banker. My parents are making me do this interview. And he said, um, well, that's just too bad because if you got this job, you'd be in 40 countries over the next three years, understanding the, the economics and the financial aspects of those, of those countries. And, and you know, Bill, my whole life, all I ever wanted to do was really know the world and understand it. I was foreign affairs economics with the French minor. And um, I said, like, could we start this interview over? And um, he allowed me, I left the room. I came back in, I reintroduced myself, and he said, so tell me, Ms. Novogratz, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, ever since I was six years old, all I ever wanted to be was a banker. And um, <laughs> I did have to do a number of interviews after that to see if I was a critical thinker, but I, I, I somehow got the job. So I was an accidental banker. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be very nonlinear in in this conversation, and so one of the things one of the things that I that I uh, failed to mention in your introduction is that uh, recently you you wrote a book, uh, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, uh, practices to build a better world, and and in this book you you identify. Uh, a, a number of practices that, that you think will help us get this job done. And so I'm gonna use some of these practices and kind of bounce around in time to have you illustrate these ideas. So uh, one, of these, one of these practices that, that you note is practice courage. And so tell us, how did you have the courage at such an early age to, to form a, a startup in Rwanda um, rather than seek the security of Wall Street, which I'm sure you easily could have chosen. Um, yeah, it, it, I think the, the whole idea of practice courage starts, you know, it's your whole life. And um, I, I would say as a kid, being the eldest of seven in a family with, you know, my dad was a, a military guy. It was very clear to us that if we were going to buy Levi's jeans, we had to get a paper route. You know, it was always about uh, moving outside your comfort zone. And I think that started to teach me entrepreneurial courage. Um, then when I went to Chase, I had a very clear, always had a very clear North Star about what was right and what was wrong. And, um, 
And, and there were a number of experiences in my time at Chase where uh, I saw things that weren't um, good for the bank and really struggled with whether I should say them out loud. Um, and, um, and it wasn't like I was a bold and brash young person. I would have to hold on to my, I remember one time holding on so tightly my, to my chair, I thought I was going to faint, but I, I got the words out through trembling lip, lips. Um, and uh, it's, it's something I will always say, you know, speak the truth, even if your lips are trembling. And, um, and so I think that there was this moment in Brazil, I was at the bank, it, we were, it was the middle of a financial crisis. Um, and I was analyzing our credit portfolio and seeing how many hundreds of millions of dollars had been made to very wealthy individuals um, for quote unquote good things. And yet the money was essentially being moved almost overnight to the Cayman Islands or other tax shelters rather than being used for the purposes um, they were supposedly borrowing for. And meanwhile, I would go into the favelas on the weekends, the slums and see so much industrial industriousness. And, um, and so it was pretty innocent. I went to my boss and said, you know, I think maybe if we made loans inside Brazil to low and middle income uh, people from Brazil, we might contribute to the company, country and get our money back because the way we're going right now actually isn't good for anybody. And, um, and I think that was the next courageous act. Um, that's when I discovered, and he said, you know, Jacqueline, Number one, this is not a moment to start a small lending operation at Chase. We're bleeding cash, which I understood. And number two, he essentially said, you know, you have a choice. At that point, we were ranked number one through 60 in my group. And he was like, you're number one in terms of productivity, but you laugh too loudly. You dress like Linda Rodstedt, this, you know, rock star of the time. And, um, and you're telling me all these stories about the poor people. Like you have to make a decision. Either you change and you become part of our culture or you should think about what else you might do because you have this great career in front of you. And that was a moment for me where I just realized if I changed to be part of the culture, I was going to change deeply who I was. And, um, and so, I would say that was a, a just a, a clear moment of decision. And then it was just following through. Again, it was hard. My parents almost had a heart attack. Um, my father thought I was giving up. Oh, because then what also happened is that it just so happened that the, num the COO of the bank, a man named Tony Trusiano, was looking for a young scrappy person to work with him, ironically, in Texas, where all the banks were failing at the time. And he essentially did offer me a kind of a job of a lifetime for a young person. And, um, and so my father looking for security for his child under understandably just was like, you cannot not take that. Uh, it'll never happen again. My mother thought I would never get married if I went to Africa. And, um, and my friends thought I'd lost my mind. My boyfriend was having a heart attack. And I remember saying to Mr. Trisiano, the 60th floor, you know, I'm 25 years old. If I don't move to another continent now, I may never do it. And that's the chance of a lifetime. And, um, and he very wisely said, well, do me a favor, just take a, a, a leave of absence then. Don't be that reckless. Um, but I knew when I left, that it wasn't about a leave of absence. Do you think the the, the banker who who brought you aside and, and had this conversation uh, understood the consequences of of that honest conversation? That I mean, was he assuming that you were going to say, "Okay, I'll 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 make the changes"? I think he was. I think he was doing his best to um, do what he thought was the way you got by, which was the way you got by, which is where so often in big institutions, you'll see in the middle, a lot of mediocrity. 
um, people getting by by doing the easy thing, not the right thing. And then at the top, you'll see this risk-taking, high level of integrity often. And, and as I've gotten older and worked with bigger and bigger institutions, I can understand now why it's so important, yes, to work with the top, but to also understand and find those change makers who are in the middle, because it's in that place where um, it's just too tempting to, to get by. And I think I intuitively understood that what he was saying is you can be like me. And what I didn't want to be was like him. Well, he he probably he was a huge gift. Yeah, it was a it was an enormous gift uh, to to really make you think about what what you cared about. So, what what you clearly cared about and have cared about for a number of years now is uh, is tackling poverty, and so. Um, here, you know, we, we had a, a quick conversation about good intentions and so on, but, uh, and that, that those are not enough. Uh, is it also possible that we've made less progress in tackling poverty successfully because we don't actually understand the right goal? Uh, because I, I've heard you talk about uh, poverty and the opposite of poverty, and, and it's not wealth, which may be what people think is the real goal. So can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Very few people ever, actually you're the first person that's asked me. Yes, because in terms of absolute poverty, we've actually made extraordinary progress since I started working in trying to solve big problems 35 years ago. Um, when I worked in Rwanda, 1986, the average income yearly was $112. Um, the 40% of the world lived under a dollar a day, 40%. Um, and, you know, in, in Rwanda at the time, between 20 and 25% of all children died before they were five years old. Fast forward to today, and it's, it's you know, we have about 9% of the world who live in absolute poverty. Almost everyone on the planet owns a cell phone. There's real connectivity um, on, on an absolute level. We have made just breathtaking strides in health, in education, in gender, in um, even over the last 15 years, electrification. But what you're talking about is when I'll say the opposite of poverty is not wealth, the opposite of poverty is dignity. And by dignity, this is about freedom, it is about choice, it is about opportunity. And where that has come home so hard um, in this moment of income disparity, inequality, and growing divisiveness and dividedness, not to mention climate change, is that um, what we see in the United States around us. 10 years ago at Acumen, we decided that we were going to move into a new geography. At the time we were in Pakistan, India, East and West Africa. And, um, and I thought long and hard about where would you go next? We could go to Afghanistan, Central Asia, but um, we understood the, the poverty in absolute terms, people who made one, two, three dollars a day. But what we didn't understand was the, was the poverty of inequality. And, and since working in Latin America and the United States, what I've come to understand at much deeper levels is that with the poverty of inequality, um, we're reminded that as, as social beings, we're constantly comparing ourselves. And so this sense that you have been fully left out, that you are far behind, actually reduces the way that we see ourselves within the context of society. And that poverty, that lack of, of, of being able to contribute um, may be the worst kind of poverty of all. And we see that in the opioid crisis, the suicide rates, the way that the, 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 our underutilization of so many people across the United States and increasingly Europe and Latin America um, have created a, its own sort of disease. Um, and that is, that's the work of this generation, um, our generation going forward. 
So uh, you, you, you made reference to these, these terrible times with regard to polarization, increasing divisiveness here and, and around the world. I mean, this, these are not localized phenomena. Mm -hmm. These are things that, that we see. And so I'm going to come back to one of your, your practices that, that you think we need uh, to, to deal with these, these challenging times, which is the idea that we can hold opposing values in tension. And so can you, can you explain that and, and then tell us how we do that? <laughs> I can tell you the principle. <laughs> the practice is not always as easy. Yeah, you know, again, I, I think that when you set off to do something, um, we often think we either know the answer or that we're on this path that is a good path. And therefore, um, we really underestimate the forces that will fight us to actually create change. And I thought a lot um, as we look at this past year with Black Lives Matter and so much of the powerful activism, that there's a real difference between the activism that opens people to possibility and then the pragmatic skill set of building. And, and actually building requires a compromise, navigating gray in ways that can be terribly uncomfortable. And that's where um, the idea of holding posing values and truths and tension. You take the work that Acumen does, right? We invest long-term equity in debt. It's backed by patient capital. It's backed by philanthropy. And so we have a commitment to be more generous as investors. We want to invest more than we extract. It's one of our principles. Um, that means we have to recognize the power dynamics that exist between us and, and an entrepreneur, help them actually understand the terms that we are negotiating while also negotiating with accountability. So generosity, accountability, so that we can actually build a viable business that we can then um, help grow and bring in other investors. It means that we have to have the, the courage um, when things go wrong, not only to confront what has gone wrong, but in some, some cases to walk away from something, uh, shut something down, take someone to court. And there have been times when um, we've been in a co-investing situation um, and our co-investors will just assume when we're having a turnaround that Acumen will just pick up the mess. And, and, and I've had this said to me two or three times, you know, Jacqueline, you, go, you get on these stages and you talk about love, you talk about we have to worry about the poor, and now we're in the situation where we're, this company needs turning around and you should be the one that comes in. And I'll say, but we've already put in more investment capital than anybody else in this. We were the first ones in, you are a co-investor. Um, our, our capital is patient, it is not stupid. And, um, and there's almost a shock. And what I've learned is that you don't solve these problems, particularly when you're going against very powerful status quo. If you aren't willing to hold the generous, the accountable, Martin Luther King talked about love and power. And, um, and it's, it's not a skill set we teach enough, um, maybe because it's uncomfortable, but it is one that I think our best leaders um, intuitively learn because they practice um, being hard and soft, dealing with the nonprofit and the for-profit, recognizing you, you need government and the private sector. And those same skills are very critical when negotiating and navigating across lines of difference, different belief systems. Um, because sometimes you have to partner with people, not only that you might not like, but that may seem as your adversary. So to, to follow up on that, uh, you, you spent your life working in finance and you're, you're using you know, traditional financial vehicles to, to tackle 
these issues around dignity and and so on. Um, and so you've come up with another uh, practice, which is use use power of markets. Don't be seduced by them. And so, uh, can you can you elaborate on on what it what it means to you know see that line between using the power of markets, but but not falling victim to to, to temptation in some way? Yeah, well, this is where you know you and I were talking before that business can be such an incredibly powerful tool for change, and um, and yet the markets can be a, a blind instrument. Um, that, that how do we think, what are the goods that markets do, right? Markets help you listen. When you're, when you're giving a gift to someone, it's highly unlikely that that person is going to tell you all the reasons they hate the gift. When you ask someone to pay for something, um, you're more likely to be engaged in a conversation about what they like, what they don't like, how you can improve it. And we've seen this play out a thousand, uh, more than a thousand times with low-income people. Um, around the world. Um, so markets allow that listening in quick innovation. We see it in the pandemic, uh, rapid innovation, let things fail, try things again, collaborate quickly, um, um, allocate in very efficient ways. Where they fail is they are not equal ways. Where they fail is where those who have no voice um, often then have no power to negotiate. And one of the, the massive failures is in food systems, um, particularly when you're looking at commodities. And so take the coffee industry, which is a $200 billion industry, a, a lion's share of the farmers that are growing the coffee beans uh, earn under $2 a day. And so, um, and then where I live in the West Village, that same coffee might cost $17 a pound. And, um, and so a pretty intrepid entrepreneur um, who started named uh, Tyler Youngblood was in Colombia, started to understand the brokenness of a supply chain that would have farmers toiling um, for the entire year and, and not be able to survive while people on the other the, the, the coffee drinkers were, were spending $5 a cup. And so um, he just broke all the rules and he decided that if he could provide a consistent high quality uh, bean to buyers, they would actually value and be willing to pay higher prices. And if he could build trust among farmers he could work with them to negotiate a much higher price, but he wasn't waiting for them to create the collective bargaining themselves. He became an intermediary on behalf of the farmers. And so um, he takes a whole community of trust model. He negotiates with the farmers, ignoring global commodities prices altogether. Um, and instead has come to understand what the production costs are of the farmers for a pound of coffee. And then we'll negotiate a price, not only for this year, but for the, the next three years, regardless of what happens to the global prices, so that the farmers for the first time in their lives can actually plan whether they can afford to send their kids to school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and this past year when the price of coffee was about 99 cents a pound, which is what most farmers were being paid, um, Azahar farmers were making about 310. So it's, um, it's quite a radical change that's connected to more of a living wage. Bigger companies like Stumptown are willing to pay um, because of the higher quality and because they know increasingly that with greater transparency, their customers will value that the farmers that are growing the beans for their cup um, are being paid or part of the process and there's full transparency. So those farmers know exactly the price that their coffee is getting on the retail market. And um, I never saw this in my lifetime, um, having worked with smallholder farmers in markets like coffee and chocolate in the eighties and the nineties with transparency, but also with the different value set 
this recognition that that many of these market rules um, no longer serve an interdependent world. And therefore we need new rules, but very few have the courage to break those rules and before the herd follows because people look at you like you're crazy, you're not very smart, um, something must be wrong with you. But the joy of my life is that I get to be kind of at the vanguard of seeing a growing core of entrepreneurs that wanna take the skills and the tools and the opportunities of business in purpose of solving some of our toughest problems. Um, and they're doing it. So uh, business schools are, are pretty much built on this notion of using markets and, and efficient markets and so on uh, to drive business decisions. The, that model would not get you to the solution that you described uh, for the, the, the coffee uh, supply chain. And so my, my question is, how, how should MBA education change? What, what do you think we should be doing differently to prepare the, the future entrepreneurs, innovators, and world changers uh, to, to really use the, the, the power of business in, in its, full, its full beauty? Thank you for, I love the way you talk. In its full beauty, because that, that is the possibility and that is the promise. Um, and again, both you and I went to school when capitalism had been raised to the rank of a religion. Um, in my ethics class, you were wrong if you didn't subscribe to the belief that it was our ethical, not just our fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value. And what's so exciting is that a new conversation is emerging. That is still um, a very popular view, but it is not a universal, it's not a universal view. It's not seen as truth any longer. And so I think, and this is the reason I wrote my book. Um, and it's been fun. I, I'm on the, the social enterprise board at Harvard um, to, to talk there where people were like, the first time we read the book, we were thinking that this was you know, a really strong set of values based on the work that you've been doing. And now we realize that these are, these are business principles. Um, it's just for the new business. But I, I, I recognized over time after the sweat and the tears of helping to build these businesses that um, essentially when you are reimagining systems because you know the current ones don't work, but you haven't fully figured out the model for what will work, a roadmap does not exist. And so we need to be teaching and giving our students a compass instead. And it can't just be a compass that is based again in an archaic form of understanding that the purpose of business is to maximize shareholder value, not in the world that we live in where we have a mere decades to know whether we will be sustainable or not. It has to be a moral compass and we need a new set of skills and tools so that we can build on that compass. It starts with redefining success away from money, power and fame. And that means we shouldn't just be putting on our lists of who is successful, those who make the most money, but rather those who make the most change. We invested in two of my classmates at Stanford, not classmates, two um, Stanford grads who graduated about 15 years after I did. Um, when they had a $30 solar, type, solar light and this dream that they would eradicate kerosene, which was insane at the time because 1.5 billion people had no access to kerosene. Well, they've, they've since been, built a $100 million company that has brought over 100 million low-income people light electricity and they've essentially unleashed a revolution that where we're halfway now to electrifying the, the world because of these two it took a long time for the business school to recognize that these guys were like you don't get more successful um i think we need to teach the skills of partnership 
in ways that we, we too often don't. When we think about business, we often think of it in terms of how do we navigate around government? How do we influence regulations? Rather than where do we have to partner with government? And, and how do we partner in ways that don't assume what government is great at? Because in some countries, they may be great at, the, at regulations and in other countries, they may have more trust than the business community. And so one of our companies is a chicken company um, in Ethiopia, when government ran the chicken industry, there were very few live chickens in any of the poultry farms. Um, and so they sold the rights to these two young guys that had a, a vision for turning the chicken industry upside down. The assumption was the government should stay out of the, of the company. But what they, had, what they learned because they had the humility to listen was that government actually did have more trust with smallholder farmers in rural areas. And so they had to reconfigure their model and partner with government to be essentially their distributors while they held the control of quality efficiency and, and building out the business model. And they now serve about 20 million smallholder farmers across um, Ethiopia. And in approaching government with that kind of respect, partnering where government was strong and they were weak, but holding on and controlling what they were good at um, and giving credit. Uh, government credits them with reducing childhood malnutrition by 11%. So it's these kinds of skills, critical thinking, um, using business to solve our toughest problems rather than to make money and then hope, hopefully to do no harm or to do some good on the side. Um, it's a different kind of orientation and it's one that um, our business schools have every possibility to, to embrace, but it really means a rethink. So I, I wanna follow up on uh, your, your two different examples where in, in one case you were talking about the importance of partnering with humility and in the other case you were talking about this kind of audacious goal of bringing electricity uh, to, to areas that had never imagined that was possible. So in fact if I bring those two things together one of your, your principles uh, is uh, to partner with humility and audacity. And so here, here's my question, which is um, how, how do you keep audacity from overpowering humility? And I, I've heard you tell this really interesting story about being in Pakistan and saying, I've got this, I've got this light for you. And, uh, and no one wanting, anything of it. So, so tell me, you know, how, how, how do you maintain that humility when you, you've got this, you know, I've got this amazing thing I can do for you and, and people aren't ready to, <laughs> to, to go down the path that, that you think is the path. Um, and, and maybe you need to elaborate around my, I'll my, tell the story. I'll tell the story and then I will, I will, but you know, the answer is, is, we, we also have to practice listening. And I think that the business schools, um, we, we often get good at speaking um, at business schools and speaking with authority and a sense of certainty. And I think we can do a better job at, uh, at, at teaching listening. And in this case, um, and it goes to holding values and intention as well, um, humility, audacity. In this case, as you said, so, you know, we've invested in this light company for the first five, six years. We never really knew if D-Light was going to go bankrupt or succeed. Um, we, we were really humbled through it. I had thought if we had this one financial instrument of patient capital, um, things would really work. I didn't understand the status quo that got in the way of solar electricity. People had no financing, they had no income. They were surrounded by complacency and bureaucracy and corruption. They had no trust. So you have to build a business there and there, there's no ecosystem. You have to be totally vertically integrated. Um, but 
the resiliency, the grit, the, the humility that, that these guys had to listen to very, very poor people um, as customers, to take them seriously, to design for them. That was the moral imagination. That was that, was that humility, but they never let go of that North Star. Um, so once we were going, I was so excited to just take delight wherever we could around the world. And, um, and so this is now uh, several years ago. And we were, I was in Pakistan where we've got um, this big agricultural bank now um, in Bawapur, which is a, it's a, it's a tough area. It was at the time known for kind of the epicenter of extremist madrasas. Uh, on that day, it was about 123 degrees in the shade. And um, I was sitting outside uh, talking to a group of women weavers whose husbands were farmers borrowing at the bank. And, um, and I wanted to understand the family income systems. I knew these women finally had income. And so, um, and it was a fully unelectrified area. So I said, you know, we have this light and it costs $30 and it's from, um, we're selling them like hotcakes in India and East Africa. And if you would like, I could find a way to get it licensed to bring it into Pakistan. And this, um, you know, 20 eyes just kind of stared at me like, who is this woman? And then this one woman finally leaned forward and she was just dripping sweat. And she said, we don't want to like, we're hot, bring us a fan. And I was like, fan? I don't have a fan, <laughs> I have a light. But if you have this light, your kids can study, you can work late. And she cut me off, she's like, we work enough, we're hot, bring us a fan. And, um, and it stopped me in my tracks because I fancy myself this you know, great listener. And, um, and I thought, what is she telling me? We don't have a fan. And that night we went back to my little guest house that had no air conditioning. And I took a, a, a shower in tepid water because it was so hot, the water couldn't even get cold. And I was lying in my bed underneath this clickety clack of a fan. And I thought, thank God I have a fan. And um, of course, fan. And now, when we're in really, really hot climbs, you can't sell a solar home system unless you have a fan. Um, and in talking to those people and really listening to them, my assumption when we first got into the, the clean energy business was that of course, one of the great social impacts of getting people light and electricity was that their children would do better in school. Not the case. People feel dignity there's extraordinary dignity in being able to turn on a light, think about it at night, rather than a dirty, smelly kerosene lamp that you can't find half the time. There's dignity in being able to read your Bible or Quran at night, uh, to stay up talking, um, to sew or do whatever you wanna do. Two, three hours a night people get once they have electricity that they didn't have before. Um, but if you really wanna get your kids to do well and you live in a hot place, a fan keeps the bugs away. A fan keeps the air moving. They sleep better. They do better at school. Um, and that's where that humility comes from. But the skill you're talking about, that we, not just in our business schools, but in our corporations, in our elementary schools, in our families, um, in our religious communities, is listening. Everybody's talking. Everybody's flinging opinions. But where we really learn is when we listen. So um, I, I want to flip around to the other side of, uh, of this notion around markets, which is you, you do believe there is value in markets and, uh, and you, you believe in the importance of profits uh, as a way to sustain activity as opposed to thinking about charity. And so how, how did you come to believe that that, that was the, the better model to use markets in that way and, and can you tell us, what does it mean to have patient capital, which you, you referred to? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, as I said before, I, I do think that the market, although it's very flawed, can be a very powerful listening device. Um, just as, as 
I feel so grateful to have had that experience at Chase where I saw the power of finance investing to unleash entrepreneurial capability, jobs, and um, new ideas and turning them into realities. And I saw how markets can overlook or exploit the poor. In Rwanda, what I saw was the flip, as you said. I saw how too often top-down approaches to charity, aid, philanthropy, um, can create a sense of dependency amongst people. And dependency really is the opposite of dignity. Um, and when the genocide happened in Rwanda, um, uh, several years after we, I started the bank in 86 and the genocide happened in, in 94, um, a couple of things happened. First, I lost hundreds of people that I knew and, and several dear, dear uh, friends. Um, and I saw that um, it can be very easy in times of great instability and insecurity for, um, for demagogic leaders to prey on our insecurities, to make us blame other people um, for what might be inside of us and how easy it is to fall prey to that and sometimes do terrible things. And that I connected to the, um, a lot of the irresponsibility of aid that in Rwanda in those times, if you wanted to get ahead, you joined the government. It was easier to quote unquote, make money than being an entrepreneur. And so that whole system felt to me so broken that there was something much more powerful about giving people that choice and that opportunity. And indeed, if you think about the off-grid energy revolution, now we are the largest investor for off-grid, for the poor in the world. Um, by rallying energy and forces across every tribe, every religion in East Africa, um, the, there have been over 400,000 jobs created. 100 million people, well, many more beyond Acumen's companies, um, have access now to electricity. The world is changing in those ways. Um, that would have taken so much philanthropy and other people being able to decide who got the lights. And again, in times of insecurity, the who gets too often can be decided by tribe, ethnicity, religion, uh, race. And, um, and so if we can break through that, and this goes back to that moral revolution, if we can rally around solving problems and being more ecumenical about the kind of capital that we put against that problem, the kind of talent that we put against the kind, that problem, the kind of partnership we need to create, then we can solve that problem. There isn't a single problem that we couldn't solve but it means getting outside of ourselves and staying focused on the North Star of the problem and rather being, than being controlled by the tools, whether it's capital, whether it's technology, whether it's our own ego, um, finding those ways to work across. Um, it's not that difficult. So you've, you've been in the impact investing space for quite some time, and the, the field of impact investing has changed quite a bit. Uh, you, you might say that impact investing has gone mainstream, um, and you see these you know, billion-dollar funds in, in the impact space. And I, I asked the question about patient capital because here I would say this is not patient capital, that they're... They're looking for returns that at the same speed and, and rate as any other fund. So I'm just curious, how, how do you feel about this evolution of, of impact investing um, that, that's taken place? Well, I, I think it's still net, net good that, that we 
or even putting a modifier before the word investing. Um, hopefully the modifier can go away and all investing will be seen as only useful if it's creating some sort of impact. That said, as you said so well, there's a spectrum of capital. Um, it starts with grant funding. It goes to patient capital, which is what the mainstay of what Acumen does. Um, it's philanthropic backed 10 to 15 year uh, equity and debt investing. Um, that then is accompanied by significant support to help entrepreneurs actually go through the process of uh, what it takes to create new markets. Um, and, uh, and then any money that gets back, we reinvest. The next phase I would call the early growth capital, we actually thought was going to be the area where the impact investors would come in. And indeed, like you said, well, you didn't say it this way, but what I would say is so many of the impact investors um, are starting to carry forth, uh, unfortunately, the same ideology that I saw 25, 30 years ago. Um, but now it has a new spin, which is I can solve problems of world hunger and deforestation and make a 30% return. And again, it's the wrong starting point. And so what we saw in that early growth stage in the energy sector was that even when we got companies to $50 million in revenues um, and profitable, it still wasn't enough for most of the impact investors. So then we went and we built um, three additional for-profit funds um, that are, are more traditional impact um, funds, except they, they've used more of a blended capital approach. And this is where I think is the new territory um, that I'm really excited by, that you are starting to see a recognition, not at the edge, where, which is more where you're talking about, but um, in the early growth phase where there is a growing group of institutions that recognize that business as usual isn't working not if we're going to solve these tough problems. And so we've just been part of um, catalyzing and helping to build a $100 million concessionary debt facility um, to help the off-grid energy sector ess essentially move through COVID and stay whole so that we don't lose too many more, more jobs. And, um, and that's been fascinating to be part of because there have been grant makers traditional investors, um, institutions willing to take first loss capital, others that are seriously going concessionary. And I'm seeing more and more of that. Granted, it's at the edges, but I think this is the new frontier and it is such a creative space in which to be working. And that gives me hope. So speaking of, of hope, uh, and, and sadly, we're, we're running close to the end of our hour here, but, uh, but another principle from your, your Moral Revolution book um, is embrace the beautiful struggle. And uh, without a doubt, uh, these, are, these are times when people are struggling and they're scared, they're anxious, they have good reason to be scared and anxious, they're, you know, they're, they're lonely, they wanna to belong to something. Um, and yet you, you aren't scared by difficult times. Uh, you, you, see, uh, you see some upside and in particular, uh, I'm going to quote you here. Um, you, you don't walk into these situations, I quote, with blind eyed optimism, uh, rather you believe in hard edged hope. Uh, and so, how, how can we, as you kind of message to our community, um, how do we maintain hope in, in these incredibly challenging times? Hmm. Yeah, and, um, and I'm thinking about all of the students at Fuqua and how it isn't easy uh, getting an MBA in the best of times. And here you all are, um, with all these expectations of what this experience was going to be and dealing with the realities of what this experience is. Um, 
And so just, I, want, I just want to acknowledge that, that you're who I'm speaking to. Um, and at the same time, I, I do think maybe because of just having moved, gone toward difficulty for most of my life after 9-11, making a decision to work in Pakistan um, and, and how I felt so lost in the forest at the beginning of that time, the day I arrived, um, the journalist Daniel Pearl uh, was beheaded and the, a picture of his beheading was in the um, Wall Street. I was on the front page of the, the local paper and I thought, what, what am I doing? Um, not exactly what I thought I would be doing as a CEO, but making that commitment to go into it, understand it. And, um, and now all these years later, 20 years later, this is a country that has enriched my life and become part of me in ways I never could have imagined. That I think because of my life seeing a genocide, um, losing people, seeing really the ugly and yet the resiliency of people who've decided now we're gonna make something beautiful out of this. And they have. Rwanda is a miracle in so many ways. It has its flaws and I'm the first one that could give you a rundown of what they are. And yet there's this sense of being indomitable. Um, and so I would say the beautiful struggle that nobody talks about at the beginning of these journeys. One is how hard it will be. And um, I've got the lines to prove it. Um, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of failures, a lot of setbacks, um, a lot of times where you feel like um, the world thinks you may just be not a good investor. You may not be very, very smart. All the things that, you know, when people tell you why you're so crazy and you know they're wrong, but you wake up in the middle of the night and you think, I think they're wrong. Um, that's part of the life of change. But the other thing that they don't tell you is that if you open yourself to it, at every step along the way, there is beauty to be found. Um, and part of, part of the, the roadmap and the compass is to make a commitment to yourself to look for it. And it may be not right in front of you and therefore you go, you find your touchstones. For me, it's poetry, it's going on really long runs, it's nature. For others, it might be prayer, um, meditation, art, song. And um, it doesn't matter what it is, but it's that touchstone that brings you back to the why you have made this decision. And the more you do that, the more you're able to see and embrace that beauty. Um, the more that you also see that broken people who are the most resilient are the ones who dance. They are the ones who sing. They are the ones who create beauty. And even in this time of this pandemic, just look at the outpouring of kindness, of beauty, of new models that are all around us. So I have come to believe that the opportunity of the difficult is to show us our most beautiful selves. And, um, and I think that COVID has broken our hearts um, and it has broken our hearts open to the recognition that all around us now are these intractable problems that are really opportunities waiting for us to solve. And um, we don't have time, but the level of creativity that I have seen in entrepreneurs across Acumen's ecosystem, not just of our companies, but we also have 750 fellows that are earlier in their entrepreneurial journeys. And they're transforming industries even as we speak. And, um, and so I just wish each and every one of you every good thing on your journey, but to know that You've never been more needed by the world. And, and I can't imagine a more extraordinary life than that life of committing to things that are so big 
you might not even accomplish them in your lifetime. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you for leaving us on that note of, of real hope and opportunity for, for positive change in the world. Without a doubt, uh, it's become very, very clear during our conversation why you were considered one of the most brilliant business minds uh, in, in the world. Also, uh, even though you reject the notion of heroes, thank you for showing us what it means to engage in heroic acts and being the kind of role model that can inspire and motivate others to also engage in those heroic acts. And in our community, our highest accolade is to be a leader of consequence. Thank you for role modeling what it truly means to be a leader of consequence. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I can't wait to come to Fuqua in person. I'm such a, a great fan. We're, we're ready to welcome you. Soon. <laughs> <laughs>